Good morning. Good morning or good afternoon, friends. Um, and I want to thank you and uh, welcome you to this uh, to this event. We really thank you for joining us for this important discussion on the African continental free trade area and uh, this new World Bank report on the economic and distributional effects of uh, uh, what could be and what is certainly going to be the largest free trade area in the world by membership. Um, just uh, for uh, our audience, uh, we welcome your questions through the World Bank live chat and you can follow the conversation online using hashtag uh, AFCTA, AFCFTA impact. So today's conversation comes uh, at a really important time as countries are thinking about how not only to respond to COVID-19, but also to recover from its economic impact. Sub-Saharan Africa, as most of you know, has been pushed into a recession for the first time in 25 years due to the pandemic. And as countries plan to build back better, trade will play an integral role. I would say trade should actually be part and parcel of our strategy to fight COVID. In fact, in our Africa's polls in April, we found that the most catastrophic impact of COVID would happen if countries close borders and stop trading between themselves. So trade should actually be part of the solution, not an afterthought and not just kept for the recovery. And as you all know, I'm sure, the African continental free trade area is one of the best things that has happened to Africa in a very, very long time. So this report is bringing evidence, hard numbers, facts to what that zone could achieve. So the report we are launching today, um, and, and I hope the discussion we will have will help us really to bring those ideas on how to maximize the potential of this agreement and position it as one of the most essential partnerships for Africa's future. Because the Continental Free Trade Agreement could not only help our countries create and densify regional value chains, it can also help integrate better value chains globally. And I'm sure Caroline will tell us a little bit more about it and Marila as well. So I would like to start then by asking Caroline Freud, the World Bank Global Director for Trade, Investment and Competitiveness, and also the co-director of the World Development Report on Trade and Value Chains 2020, to share opening remarks. After Caroline, I would ask Marila Malizeska, my colleague in the World Bank, Senior Economist for the Macroeconomics Trade and Investment Global Practice, who's also uh, the, one of the main co-author of this report. I will ask them to uh, speak and share with us briefly the gist of this report. Without further ado, over to you, Caroline. Uh, thank you very much, Albert, and welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here at the launch of this report. Um, we come to this discussion of the Africa Continental Free Trade Area 
at a very unusual t time for trade. So 2020 was supposed to be the year of open borders in Africa. After years of negotiation, the concrete implementation of the continental free trade area was finally on the agenda. But then the coronavirus came. And initially, and 43 of the 54 states in Africa closed some of or all of their borders. Uh, this happened around the world. It was not unique to Africa, where to prevent the spread of the disease, it was important to restrict uh, movement. Over time, many of those restrictions have eased. Uh, essentials continued to flow and over time also trade. Uh, but, but the movement of people has really stalled. Um, even so, as other countries have erected new trade barriers or postponed agreements, policymakers in Africa have continued to move forward on the continental free trade area, and that's very important. The continental free trade area is an important undertaking and it will help to cement future growth. Uh, and we hope to see it move forward and to see a timeline in the coming months. Um, we've already seen in the midst of this coronavirus pandemic how African countries can help each other. Ghana is making hand sanitizer. Rwanda is making face masks. Test kits are being done in Senegal, and I think the list goes on. Um, but COVID is disrupting some of the global value chains uh, now around the world, and Africa really has a chance to get on board. We've already seen with these examples how quickly Africa can move into new products um, and from a small economy perspective, there much more, there's a much bigger ability to grow if they work together. Inputs to production are more available in a large economy. Market size really matters. So the African continental free trade area is a move to expand that market size and make inputs more available. It also gives you a much bigger consumer base, which is attractive for foreign investors. So removing these border barriers will be really critical to attracting foreign investment, attracting manufacturing, and growing through the region, as well as for trade and services. The report released today shows the potential gains from trade in Africa. Income can be boosted by, by $450 million from complete, imp, from complete implementation of the agreement. And I think one of the most interesting facts that comes out of this report is that trade facilitation is really critical. So while there are gains from removing tariffs alone, removing non-tariff barriers, but especially trade facilitation will make those gains much, much larger. So reducing costs from excessive paperwork and difficult border cro crossings, removing those barriers accounts actually for about two thirds of the gains from the Africa continental free trade area. So it's not just about removing tariffs, what will be really important is to implement this agreement in a way that trade can flow seamlessly across borders, making those markets much richer and bigger. Another interesting feature is that women stand to gain a lot, both in terms of reducing the wage gap and in terms of jobs. This is because many of the the, much of the employment from trade is in industries where women tend to be employed. So there are really big gains for everyone, but women especially from this agreement. Um, 
when we think about trade in Africa, in some sense, right now, there's an anti-regional trade bias. And what do I mean by that? I mean, there's less trade than would be expected given the size of the economies because of these border barriers. And as I mentioned, particularly the difficulties crossing borders and trade facilitation. There's some regional agreements within Africa that have helped to remove that bias within small areas. But the problem with that is it also creates what we call a spaghetti bowl of, of regional trade agreements where there are these different overlapping agreements, sometimes overlapping agreements that do help to boost trade within with members, but they discriminate against non-members, which isn't as good for welfare as if it was all one big agreement. And that's what the Africa continental free trade area moves towards is joining all these agreements into one group. So my understanding is that currently the decision on the start date of trading under the Africa continental free trade area is still being considered by the assembly of heads of state of the African Union. We hope to see movement on that very soon because as the report today shows, and it's one of many reports on the agreement that show sizable welfare and income gain, um, the sooner we start, the sooner we move towards the medium rung gains that will be quite large. So over to Marilla to present the report and then back to Albert to moderate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline. Over to you, Marilla. Thank you very much, Albert. Give us the substance of this report. <laughs> thank you so much, Albert, and thank you, Caroline, for the for the remarks. I'm here to um, give you an overview of the key findings of the report. Um, um, just perfect. The report has been conducted in close collaboration with the African Union Commission, for which we're very grateful. It comes at a critical time. Uh, as Karin just mentioned, African countries were supposed to start trading at reduced tariffs on July 1st. Despite understandable delay due to COVID-19, the continued negotiation of the remaining areas and implementation of the agreement remained critical. Creating a single continent-wide market for goods and services, business and investment could reshape African economies. This report considers economic and distributional impacts of the agreement. It highlights the role it can play in supporting and lifting African economies during and post COVID-19. It does so by applying a variety of analytical tools and new data. Why is the AFCFTA important? Well, once completed, it will be the largest free trade area in the world, comprising 55 nations and 1.3 billion people. It covers an economic area with a GDP valued at $3.4 trillion. The scope of the AFCFTA is large. It covers tariffs and policy areas such as trade facilitation, trading services, as well as regulatory measures such as sanitary standards and technical barriers to trade. It provides a major opportunity to help African countries diversify their trade and economies, attract foreign investment, accelerate growth, provide new job opportunities, and reduce poverty. However, achieving its full potential will depend on putting in place significant policy reforms and trade facilitation measures. What are the agreement's economic effects? AFCFTA would significantly boost African trade, particularly interregional trade in manufacturing goods. The volume of total exports could increase by almost 29% in 2035 as compared to what it would have been without the AFCFTA. In addition, the intra-African export could increase by 81%. The countries that benefit the most from increases in intra-African trade flows would include Cameroon, Egypt, Ghana, Morocco, Tunisia, with exports almost doubling or tripping compared to what they would have been without the AFCFTA. 
expansion of trade would lead to significant income gains. As Colin just mentioned, real income in Africa could increase by 7% or nearly $450 billion by 2035 relative to the baseline without the AFCFTA. Biggest gains would come from the implementation of trade facilitation measures, which improve hard and soft infrastructure at the borders, and through regulatory harmonization, reducing non-tariff barriers to trade. But the aggregate numbers mask the heterogeneity of impacts across countries and sectors. Certain countries would be likely to gain more than others. For example, Ivory Coast or Zimbabwe would see income gains of 12 to 14 percent, while a few countries would see smaller real income gains, only around 2 percent, such as Madagascar, Malawi, Mozambique. The higher the initial trade costs, the bigger the potential gains from AFCFTA. Now, this faster growth rate would also lead to poverty reduction. So what are the distributional impacts of the agreement? AFCFTA could lift an additional 30 million people out of extreme poverty by 2035. This accounts to, for 1.5% of the population of the continent. Countries with high initial poverty rates would experience the greatest decline, and those include Guinea, Togo, Mali, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Niger, and Central Africa Republic. The moderate poverty would also improve. At the moderate poverty line at $5.50 a day, AFCFTA could lift an additional 68 million people out of poverty. This accounts for 3.6% of the population. Half of the people lifted from moderate poverty will be from Ethiopia, Nigeria, Tanzania, Democratic Republic of Congo, Kenya, and Niger. Finally, implementation of the AFCFTA will increase employment opportunities and wages. New employment opportunities would arise from the expansion of output and in industries employing unskilled workers and women more intensively. It would also help close the gender gap. By 2035, average wages of workers would be 10% higher under AFCFTA, but the gains for women would be uh, even higher. COVID pandemic provides even stronger rationale to proceed with the AFCFTA. As my predecessors have already mentioned, um, the COVID has taken a huge toll uh, in human and economic terms on the continent. Economic growth in the region is projected to decline significantly, but the welfare losses would have been even higher if the sub-regional trade blockages persisted. Border closings have disproportionately affected the poor, particularly small-scale cross-border traders, agricultural workers, and unskilled workers in the informal sector. In the short term, AFCFTA could help cushion the negative effects of trade of COVID on trade and growth by supporting regional trade and value chains. It is also critical for the movement of medical supplies and food. In the medium to long run, AFCFTA would increase the resilience of African economies. It would make them much better prepared in the face of any future shocks by enhancing regional collaboration by reducing trade costs and by diversifying their economies. Finally, the AFCF provides a unique opportunity to anchor expectations by providing a credible path for integration and growth enhancing reform for African economies. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh... Marila, uh, so this this uh, new report is uh, clearly uh, showing all the potential of this uh, agreement, and um, not only will it increase incomes, not only will it lift millions out of poverty, it's also going to be good for women. And as I always thought and said. You know, gender economics is the best economics that we can actually do. So, um, you know, if it's good for women, it's certainly good for all. So um, let's, uh, um, you know, all work together to move this uh, uh, agreement from potential to reality. 
And to discuss those issues, I have a, uh, you know, a panel of uh, three extremely prominent uh, people. Um, I have um, uh, the pleasure of introducing Honorable uh, Betty uh, Miner, the Cabinet Secretary of the Ministry of Industrialization, Trade and Enterprise Development in Kenya. The second panel member is uh, Ms. Trudy Hartenberg, Executive Director of the Trade Law Center. And our third panelist is Mr. Prudence Sebahizi, the head of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement uh, Negotiations Unit. And he's also the Chief Technical Advisor on the uh, agreement. So um, welcome to uh, Honorable uh, Betty uh, Maina, with whom I will start. Welcome to all of you. So um, let, me, uh, let me start with uh, uh, Honorable uh, Maina. Um, so um, Betty, what you have heard us uh, saying uh, earlier, you have heard Caroline uh, and, and uh, uh, Marilla. Now, let me uh, start with you on the current situation, on the impact of COVID on trade uh, in your neck of the wood. Uh, can you tell us, Honorable Maina, how has Kenyan trade been affected by COVID? Um, and, and what role do you see the African Continental Free Trade Agreement uh, playing uh, in, in reviving trade? Uh, how do you see regional collaboration across African countries uh, during this pandemic? How is it playing in, uh, in EAC, for example? Over to you. Okay. <clears throat> Um, thank you very much. I, I hope you can all hear me. We can. Thank and you. And thanks for putting this uh, session uh, together. I think, as has been mentioned, uh, the COVID is affecting all economies. It's not just in Africa. And um, the depression that is anticipated uh, across Africa is also going to affect countries uh, such as Kenya and uh, we've had to revise our growth projections uh, for this year uh, as a result uh, of this COVID. The other way in which this is also affecting us is uh, um, the impact on supply chains has been quite significant uh, in the beginning, especially with uh, in the context where a lot of imports uh, in our part of the world uh, come from outside the country, and especially China and India, we've seen a great disruption of those inward, uh, inward, in, inward supplies. And I think like everybody else, the country and Kenya is also thinking a little bit more about uh, becoming a little bit more supply, uh, supply secure in future and especially for critical critical commodities. So uh, answering the second part of the question, I think there's a great opportunity uh, that comes in a context such as uh, COVID to begin to really review uh, sources of goods and supplies. And as has been mentioned, uh, many countries in Africa are starting to build up the necessary capacity within the country for some critical uh, critical supplies, and that especially in the context of medical uh, supplies. So I'm actually quite excited that in a space of two months, we've been able to localize supply for personal protective uh, equipment, for masks and, and related products, for testing a capacity or instruments for using the um, context of testing, uh, breathing support um, equipment such as ventilators. So these have all, uh, there's been a great response uh, by industry. 
But as we look forward to uh, living with COVID and even post-COVID, these are new opportunities uh, for supply and for production within the country. And uh, the Africa Continental Free Trade Area and other agreements provide an opportunity and incentive uh, for investors to expand their production uh, of these goods. But that is not just medical supplies alone. I think the Africa Continental Free Trade Area provides us an opportunity for market expansion. I note from the report that the, uh, the calculations and the analysis so far shows that a country like Kenya, which is already fairly active in international and regional trade, starts to gain uh, markets as a result, or not just markets, but gain um, additional earnings as a result of uh, this uh, SCFTA. And we look forward to that. I think um, Africa is a continent that doesn't trade a lot with each other. So the fact that it's actually possible from the analysis that's given, and, it, and this echoes, this War Bank uh, report echoes the ECA report about that came out about four months ago with exactly the same conclusion. There is great opportunities for enhanced trade that uh, the CFTA uh, provides and therefore for Kenya we are looking forward to active uh, active trading and active uh, participation in this in this market and the greater welfare gains that will come out of additional trade. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Honourable Minister. Um, you know, I, I think I think you are absolutely right. Kenya, as many other African countries, really stand to gain big from this uh, agreement. But it has to be implemented. It has to be negotiated. Uh, one of the uh, results, really, that struck a chord in me uh, of this report is the fact that you know tariff reform is only one third of the gains. Two thirds of the gains will come from removing non-tariff barriers, which mm. are under our control, right? You know, it's in our hands to remove those barriers to, you know, really streamline these procedures and uh, uh, really make it easier to trade, you know, with each other. Um, but, but at the same time, we still have a whole process to negotiate. And I want to turn to you, uh, Prudence. Uh, how has COVID affected the process of implementation of, of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement? Has it delayed the negotiation? Has it caused a sudden stop? Or have we put completely the process on the back burner? Or what's happening? Can you tell us? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Albert. I hope you can hear me well. Good. Uh, let me start by first thanking the World Bank Group for uh, this initiative and also uh, congratulate my uh, predecessors for a very informative uh, presentation that they have just made. Uh, with regard to your question, uh, COVID-19 has affected everyone, everywhere, and almost everything. And the FCFTA process is not an exception. I can summarize uh, in four points the way uh, the FCFTA process has been affected by COVID-19 uh, crisis. The first one being that uh, due to the lockdowns uh, that came with, the, uh, with social distancing and other measures taken by members, it has been impossible to proceed with physical meetings, so which affected the negotiations of outstanding issues on the FCFTA agreement. Um, you were very much aware that um, last year, uh, it was in July when the heads of state decided uh, that the start of trading will be 
set for the 1st of July 2020, uh, the date which you have already missed. And before we get there, a number of issues were supposed to be concluded on negotiations. And those issues were supposed to be wrapped up in an extraordinary summit, which was also uh, planned to take place in May this year in Johannesburg in South Africa. So when COVID-19 came in, the whole process was put at jeopardy. So I can say that the first impact was the limitation on movement of negotiators and the meetings that were planned to conclude negotiations have been put on hold. Uh, the second effect which I can see is the way the, the crisis has affected the national uh, level process. Member states have gained the momentum in ratification of the FCFT agreement. You are aware that 54 out of 55 members had already signed the agreement and 28 countries had already uh, deposited their instrument of ratification. But since the outbreak of COVID-19, we have seen that the process, the momentum of ratification has been put on hold. Uh, very recently, we have uh, seen uh, good news. About four additional countries have ratified at national level, but they were not able to, uh, to, to bring the instrument of ratification to, to the African uh, Union Commission headquarters. And I can also understand that this COVID has affected the process of consulting stakeholders at national level, which in a way delayed the process of ratification. Also, affected the uh, preparedness of members to start trading, which leads me to the third effect, which I call uh, the slowdown in the national level preparedness for start of trading. Uh, countries were supposed to undertake a number of activities at national level in the preparation for start of trading, uh, mainly uh, consultation of stakeholders, undertaking uh, um, wide consultation uh, of all stakeholders, but also uh, production of trade documents. The process at national level has been slowed down by the pandemic, and this has also affected in a way uh, the date that was set for start of trading. And last but not least is the way this pandemic has um, made it imperative for heads of state to postpone all the dates that were set uh, as our target for implementation of the FCFTA. Uh, the extraordinary summit has been postponed. Uh, it's now slated to take place in December. If everything goes well, but also the date for start of trading, which was very important for the private sector, has been pushed to January next year. So in a nutshell, you can see that the process has been slowed down at negotiation level, at implementation level, and at decision making level. And last but not least, we are trying to see how to harness the um, uh, the e-commerce and ICT tools to see if we can continue the process using online platforms. Maybe I will come back to this later, but we are also facing another number of challenges uh, with adopting the new uh, norm of doing business. Maybe I can uh, pause here for now. Thank you. Definitely. We'll, we'll definitely come back to uh, that discussion on the digital. Uh, Thank you so much. Um, so uh, it's quite clear that COVID has um, really uh, uh, put a, a break on, on, on this uh, process, but uh, I'm sure um, I'm actually quite pleased to see that a number of countries have actually still continued and, and four new countries have uh, ratified. Um, uh, it, is, it is certainly uh, a serious constraint and it may uh, jeopardize our recovery efforts if we do not get this process back in track. And, and we should definitely find ways, as you said, Prudence, to uh, continue our work, uh, you know, uh, 
despite the fact that physically we cannot uh, we cannot meet. So um, and that's where I'm going to uh, get to. Uh, uh, <clears throat> we're going to get to to our third uh, panelist, uh, Trudy. Uh, how do you see um, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement helping uh, not only Africa recovery, but, but how do you see this in, in the global context where we had this complete uh, sudden stop in, in global value chain? How do you see this in, in the process of recovering from COVID? Rudy. Thank you very much, Dr. Zoe Fach and my colleagues. It's a great pleasure to be with you. I think at the outset, we need to recognize that the African continental free trade area actually has two lives. On the one hand, it is a comprehensive free trade agreement, but it is also one of the flagship projects of the African Union. And it is on these two tracks that it can play a very significant role both in Africa's economic recovery, but also in its reconstruction and transformation. And it's very encouraging to see that, in fact, the World Bank study touches on some of the issues associated with transformation, reallocation of resources to more productive uses, for example, and the reconstruction of the African economy. What the pandemic has done is to serve to focus our attention on what really matters, what matters in terms of impediments to intra-Africa trade, to the development of regional value chains, but also very importantly, to our peripheral participation in the global economy, both in terms of trade, but also in terms of global value chains. We still are primarily commodity exporters and more than 80% of our trade is still with the global economy and not amongst ourselves. So what have we learned and how can the AFCFDA assist recovery, reconstruction, transformation and build resilience to deal with future pandemics? Because of course there will be more, whether it be climate related, whether it be health related, but certainly we will face more such global crises. The important lesson is the interconnectedness of the African continent. And it makes regional integration and an agreement such as the AFCFDA all the more important. We have seen that the unilateral measures adopted by member states, not only in Africa, but across the globe, have had dire consequences, not only for their own economies, but also for neighboring countries. Closure of a border means effectively that the other side of the border is closed as well. And trade corridors across various regions of the continent have actually slowed very, very much. We've also seen the significant queues at border posts. This means that the non-tariff agenda, as some of our colleagues have indicated, becomes all the more important because it is in that non-tariff agenda addressing the trade facilitation issues, the regulatory issues. And I would like to emphasize the role of services in this context. Services are fundamental to trade facilitation, to value chain facilitation, to the link between trade and industrial development. Because if we think about a service such as transport, which is one of the priority services sectors of the AFCFDA, if we do not have regulatory harmonization on cabotage rules, on rules related to the specifications of containers or axle load limits, we are driving efficiency and competitiveness to the lowest common denominator, eroding what could be enhancements to our capacity to produce tradables competitively on the African continent. What we have also learned from the, the COVID pandemic is that digital solutions are possible. Some African countries have adopted e-certificates of origin and standards, e-payments are working. This is so important because the efficiency and competitiveness benefits the gains 
from adopting digital trade solutions, paperless trading should carry through to the implementation of the AFC FTA. So this is now the time for us to take a look at the AFC FTA agenda, not only in terms of implementation, but some of the gaps that we have on our current agenda. For example, we don't have a simplified trade regime provided for, for informal cross-border traders. We've seen millions of livelihoods decimated by border closures. So enhancing the capacity to trade effectively across borders, even as small traders, most of whom are women, could make an extremely important contribution to livelihoods, to increasing welfare across the continent. But coming back finally, if I may chair, just the linkage of the AFC FTA to the other flagship projects. The other flagship projects include AIDA, Accelerated Industrial Development for Africa, the Programme for Infrastructure Development for Africa. The linkage among those within the context of Africa's overall development strategy, Agenda 2063, need to be leveraged now. So taking a look at some of the lessons from COVID now, we can actually start planning to expeditiously implement, but also augment in many, many digital solutions, our implementation process, but also perhaps recalibrate the agenda. So the COVID pause to some extent has given us an opportunity to appraise where we stand and whether our agenda actually is fit for purpose for the 21st century post-COVID. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Trudy. <clears throat> I really like that point on services. Um, you know, uh, trade in services is one where we are also lacking the most. And it's gonna be critical for uh, the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement to actually reach its full potential. And, and, and as you rightly said, um, the trade agenda is intrinsically linked to the industrial development and more broadly to the job agenda. And, and we definitely need to bring these all together and, and also uh, see how we bring the, uh, the, the uh, uh, vision 2063 uh, and, and implement uh, the infrastructure plan for Africa because the regulatory agenda uh, is certainly extremely important, but there is also uh, natural barriers. That thickness of borders that we see in Africa is also due to poor infrastructure. So all those have to be on the table. Now, you know, let me get back to the panel. Now we have established how crucial, how important is this uh, uh, agreement for the poor, for uh, economic transformation, for uh, really uh, boosting uh, welfare across Africa. We have establish how important it is for recovery out of COVID-19. Now I want to go to each of the panelists and ask in three minutes, can you share what you see as being the uh, biggest constraint to uh, implementation and the one or two things that you see as the greatest opportunity to realize uh, this potential, starting with you, Honorable uh, uh, Mine. Okay, um, thank you very much. I think, um, and, and I appreciate the comments from the other uh, panelists as well. Thank you, Trudy, thank you, Prudence. And uh, some things are common to, to all, I mean, I think to all our comments, which is that one of the greatest impediments to expansion of regional trade is obviously going to be the non-tariff um, non -tariff barriers. And the scheme for dealing with non-tariff barriers decisively still needs to be developed uh, and strengthened because um, many countries would still impose all these MTBs 
uh, whether deliberately or not deliberately because of the national national actions but the point is that quite a few times it is so much easier to get goods from outside the region than from within the region so that would be something we need to address uh, secondly, I think the, also the other thing that becomes uh, critical is just issues of logistics. Some of the countries who have already ratified, uh, I'm glad to hear that there's more ratification out of 28, uh, another three more also waiting to deposit. But the pattern of ratification has not, uh, has demonstrated, at least when we look at it, is that not enough countries that are contiguous or close to each other have ratified. So the cost of getting goods from a country that has ratified to another that has ratified is going to be fairly astronomical because of the cost of uh, or the cost of logistics. Uh, the third thing, and, and that's something we need to address. So if more countries who are close to each other could ratify, then that can at least be uh, a lot, a lot easier. The third thing that becomes a challenge is something that we've observed during the uh, tariff offers uh, across different regimes is that countries are still adopting a fairly defensive approach to and protective approach to these uh, tariff offers. So you you would you would probably still have you know inadequate liberalisation uh, according to across the region because there's still some high levels of protection from obviously for, for, for local industries. And if we don't have significant liberalization, it will not uh, deliver uh, what, is, uh, what is required, not, certainly not the welfare gains or trade enhancing uh, gains. So what we all need to be working at is approaching these uh, regional trade uh, uh, discussions with a, a, a greater degree uh, of, of, of openness, a greater degree and commitment to elimination of non-tariff barriers, and a greater degree of openness towards uh, development of regional, regional value chains, so that there is a greater perception of gains, especially by the private um, uh, sector. So we would need to keep working at this and to realize uh, the promise of the CFTA, because if we do not do that quickly enough, it will be very easy to still roll back to more national uh, focus and uh, yeah, and, and, and narrower focus, which unfortunately, have, as the studies have shown, have the capacity to externalize uh, trade uh, uh, and, 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 and create more gains for those who are not members of the regional trading uh, ar ar arrangements. Thank you very uh, much, Mithi. Uh, How about the opportunity? What, what do you see as the, the key opportunity for this agreement? Yeah, one of, my, one, one of the greater opportunities I've mentioned is the opportunity for uh, greater regional value chains, because mm -hmm. if the private sector can work and join together and, uh, and enhance these uh, regional sourcing, then there will be greater, in my view, there will be greater openness for uh, more liberalization. So it's also important for us to encourage the private sector to work and to collaborate uh, together. I've seen that uh, with the auto industry, for instance, that is seeking some uh, regional, uh, so some more regional collaboration. We can see that with the pharmaceutical sector as well, because not everybody will be able to produce uh, just for their own markets alone, but there's greater opportunities for uh, collaboration across the region in that regard. And then thirdly, it's a great opportunity for uh, investment in infrastructure because the greatest cost for trade in Africa is still the cost of logistics. So this is an opportunity for us to ramp up uh, the regional and the national and the, the continental infrastructure development. Thank you. Thank you so much, Honorable. So, um, Prudence, over to you uh, for you know, your top three challenges you see and the opportunity 
and I probably want you to uh, bring the aspect of the digital that you started speaking about early on. Over to you. Yes, uh, thank you very much once again, and uh, um, very much uh, thank to uh, Trudy um, and Honorable Minister uh, Betty. Uh, when you look at the, um, the situation that we have lived in over the last four uh, months, or five months. Uh, countries have come to realize that they need the FCFTA more than ever before. Um, I'm looking at countries that are landlocked first. Countries that are landlocked have realized that if each and every country in the world took measures of lockdowns, closing borders, how would landlocked countries survive? So this will bring now in the spirit of more collaboration as Honorable Minister has said it. But not only that, we have seen um, key sectors that are now proving to be more important than ever before. As Trudy mentioned that services now, logistics. Uh, let me just uh, give you one example. Uh, during the negotiations, we had thought that uh, uh, five key priority sectors will be, uh, in terms of services, will be uh, transport, uh, communication, uh, tourism, business services, and financial services. But now you can see that tourism, uh, all of a sudden, has stopped everywhere. And we have realized that we have omitted a very important sector, which is the health sector. So if we're going back to uh, the drawing board, I'm quite sure that everyone will be supporting health services to be prominent in the five priority service sectors on, in the FCFTA. The, the other aspect which has proven to be very important is um, e-commerce and digital economy. Again, they have been reluctant for member states to include e-commerce in the scope of the FCFTA right from the beginning until recently in February, when heads of state decided to uh, put it in the phase three of negotiations. But now, if you brought the issue back to negotiating table, I'm quite sure that negotiators, all of them, in a consensus manner will wish to front load negotiations on e-commerce, because that's the way to go. Again, looking at the other countries that um, thought that they are having access to the sea, they can trade with the rest of the world, you have seen now how um, the global value chains have been affected. We are now becoming self-reliant. We are looking inward because if you don't produce what you need now, you will not expect anything from outside the continent because this challenge that we are facing now may come end time in the future. So um, I just want to emphasize the need for embracing e-commerce and digital trade, as I mentioned before. Um, the lesson that we have learned with the pandemic crisis are that first, we cannot meet physically. We need to find a solution to continuing the international diplomacy uh, using online platforms. Secondly, we have realized that for us to continue trade, we need to have enough uh, digital trade platforms that can serve the continent. And we have seen a number of initiatives coming up uh, recently um, uh, someone has mentioned the, uh, the platform that has been used for uh, supply of medical products. But we are also uh, getting approached by private sector. They have come up with many other platforms that can be used as a solution to implementing the FCFTA even during uh, the period of the pandemic. And thirdly, uh, related to health again, uh, health has become a, a serious concern for everyone. And now we are seeing many initiatives coming up to
to come up with um, uh, what I could uh, call applications that can assure everyone that their health is safeguarded. So to me, uh, the, 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 the lesson of embracing ICT has even been the best in this crisis that we are trying to manage during and after the crisis, we will still have to embrace ICT. So thank you very much. I think that was very important to emphasize. No, it's, it's, it's critical. It's clearly one of the lessons of COVID. If uh, there were still, or if there are still people out there who thought the digital was a luxury for Africa, I think that discussion is now put to, to, to rest for once for all. So uh, let me uh, continue to Rudy uh, for a quick uh, uh, sense of, of uh, uh, you know, challenges and opportunities, and, and also to address one question that came from our panel, from our uh, audience. Um, and that question is, uh, how do you see um, the African continental free trade uh, area being affected by or the regional agreements such as uh, EPA or the you know agreement with trade with the European Union, uh, and how would that be affected by individual trade agreements that countries are now some starting to sign? Do you see that as a problem, Rudy? Thank you very much, Dr. Zoeva. If I may, I'll start with the last question. This is, of course, very topical right now as we are facing um, discussions around, for example, the US-Kenya proposed negotiations or, in fact, negotiations with the United Kingdom as it prepares to leave the European Union um, at the end of this year. Brexit is finally happening. I think what we do have to recognize is that, of course, the AFCFTA is a free trade area. So the members of the free trade area retain their policy space to engage with trade arrangements with third parties. In other words, they are not doing what we do in a customs union when we give up our trade policy space and adopt a single trade policy towards third parties. The practical reality is, of course, that more than 80% of Africa's trade is still with global trade partners, and that will remain important so it would not make sense to prevent any African country that is a member of the AFCFTA from exploring opportunities to promote its own development agenda. I think that's really important. Of course, it has to take into account the commitments it is making within the AFCFTA, and which it already has, so that it does not breach any of those. That said, it's extremely important that we take a look at what exists, we build on that to further our development agenda. If I may answer the next part of the question very briefly, and um, Prudence, thank you very much for raising health care in the context of the services agenda. I would like to add educational services. What we have seen is the major blow to educational services for so many of our children and young people on the continent. This is where there are significant opportunities with digitalization. However, the digital divide has to be addressed. The deficit in terms of digital infrastructure, but also devices in rural areas for children who simply do not have access to those has to be part of the overall development agenda. So I think that needs to, to be kept in mind as well. Some of the risks I see is that some countries could get left behind. And those with limited capacity, limited institutional backup and support to be able to implement the agreement may get left behind. And this is so important because it is extremely difficult to integrate 55 eventually unequal partners we should not underestimate that. Therefore, what we do need to do is to leverage what exists already. The agreement exhorts us to do that. The regional economic communities will continue to exist. Many of them have experience in a lot of areas. So we can leverage that experience and capacity. 
But when it comes to trade facilitation, I would also like to flag the WTO trade facilitation agreement. It's a landmark agreement for accommodating diversity in terms of needs, capacities, but also institutionalizing financial support, which is extremely important. So if we take a look at that agreement and what we hope to achieve in the AFC FDA, we have common objectives, common agenda. We can leverage those together. And I think that would be extremely important. I would also like to, to mention that what the AFC FDA can contribute, and I think this is absolutely critical, is an improvement in governance, trade governance. So transparency, notifications become extremely important. This is where an institution like the African Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat has a very important role to play. Its roles and responsibilities still have to be articulated by the Council of Ministers, but it will play an extremely important role. So notifications, transparency, so that the private sector and other member states know if we encounter any problems and assistance can be provided. My final point, Chair, if I may, is just to note that the AFC FDA envisages, envisages progressive liberalization, a progressive process. It explicitly recognizes the difficulty, the enormity of this challenge. And this is where I do think institutions like the World Bank our development partners, we need you to assist us through this process. It will not be an easy one and it will not be a brief one, but this is a major investment in Africa's development. Thank you very much. Excellent. Trudy, I think you got the last word there. Um, uh, it's going to be very difficult for me to summarize. We are two minutes uh, uh, past our our work. Um, I really want to thank uh, the three of you for a fantastic discussion. I want to thank uh, uh, Marila and the team. I know there's a large team behind it. As you know, most of our reports are, you know, fruits of huge teamwork. And I'd like to thank and, and really uh, congratulate the team for an excellent report. Uh, the impact, I hope, is it's going to be uh, felt across uh, the continent. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Caroline, for coming and for providing the leadership on this agenda. One thing that I would say basically is um, we are past the stage where we were still trying to convince people that the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement is something good for Africa. I think we're over it. And if anything, COVID has actually reinforce the need for greater integration across Africa, not less. If anything, COVID has actually shown to the world how important trade is for development and for poverty eradication. If anything, COVID has shown us how critical the digital is and will be in the future. So we need to work together and, uh, you know, the World Bank is here, stands ready to work with uh, you, Prudence, uh, you, Honorable uh, uh, Minister Minor, uh, with you, Trudy, to make sure our countries really follow suit, uh, speed up those negotiations. Uh, Prudence, uh, one thing that is quite interesting is because we do not need to meet physically anymore, the frequency of these meetings has actually increased, not decreased. So I hope, you know, negotiators jump on the digital bandwagon and really accelerate the process instead of, uh, you know, uh, slowing it down. So the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement just needs one thing, the political will, uh, Honorable Minor, to push forward and implement it needs the technical skills, prudence, uh, Trudia and others. We're here to help, you know, don't hesitate to uh, reach out. We are here uh, to uh, help make sure that, uh, you know, we improve trade governance, as Trudy said earlier. But 
true trade governance is not doesn't happen in a vacuum in an environment where governance is not good in general trade governance cannot be good so it's essential for our countries to really emphasize really transparency accountability and good governance across the economy and therefore in trade there's a role for the private sector we've heard and the private sector needs to be part of the process and you know where needed to push and really put forward proposals for expanding these markets across regions we need to focus on services we need to make sure that our infrastructure programs are improved and uh, it's only at that you know uh, through that effort that we will be able to lift millions and millions of people out of poverty. With this, let me thank all of you for attending one more time. Uh, let me thank our audience online and thank you so much for your excellent questions that were sent. And I'm sure you enjoyed some of the answers by our panel. Again, thank you so much and see you soon. Stay safe. Goodbye.